Louise Fentham. I completed my teacher training and my MPhil in education at the University of Cambridge and now I work as um, a teacher in a London comprehensive school. So my paper is based on my MPhil project that investigated policy and practice for EAL, so English as an additional language, in a primary school in the east of England. This was a qualitative study and I chose the school because a third of the pupils were EAL. So what is EAL? So EAL, English as an additional language, refers to students that are exposed to another language at home um, and the number of students in this group is growing now at 21.3%. And as you can see, it's a really broad group uh, with diverse needs, including those that are new to English and those who are fluent in, in English. However, we're in the context of a mainstreaming approach towards EAL. Um, and this is reflected in the lack of specific training that teachers get to support them in the classroom although the responsibility for EL people's needs is devolved to teachers, the guidance on how is really lacking in the classroom, which impacts the provision. Okay, so for my study, I used a theory um, called teacher sense making, and I adapted this for my project. So I was looking at how teachers make sense of policies um, and how they influence policies and develop them in, in their schools. And looking at um, enacting policies, so putting into place, into action policies, rather than implementing them, where the focus has tended to be on it being a top-down process, um, influenced by um, national policies, rather than um, teachers themselves on a micro level in their classrooms putting things into action. And here is my conceptual framework that I produced drawing on those points just mentioned. So you can see these three elements coming together of policy, teacher understanding, so teachers views and their practices in the classroom. So I had three research questions. So the first question uh, looked at how the school adhered to or adapted national policy guidance to formulate their own policies. Um, and the second question uh, looked at how teachers understand teaching, learning and policy related to EAL, um, drawing on their past experiences and specific instances um, as learners or teachers of EAL. And previous studies haven't focused on um, how teachers understand policy uh, messages, so this was a real key element of my study to focus on. Um, particularly um, with assessment frameworks that have been developed. There haven't been studies that have explored how teachers um, understand and, and enact those in the classrooms. And finally, my third question looked at um, how teachers' practices matched up with the national guidance and the school leadership guidance and views, how that all matched up in practice. Okay, with several methods for each of these questions coming together. So my key findings then were that there was no EL specific pol policy in the school despite the high number of EL pupils and that the senior leadership team and teachers had really different understandings of the term EAL and also of the value of languages um, in school. So, as I've said, national and school policy messages didn't fully align um, and there were tensions between that which was EAL specific and that which was general. And it emerged that there were a lot of approaches that teachers were sharing and using 
that were not specific, but they were macro adaptive. So strategies that included learners as a group based on the class characteristics. So the lack of any systematic policy or system for communicating um, about these students definitely influenced the, um, the way that teachers um, supported EL pupils in school and how they made sense of EAL. Um, and then finally, there were um, certain practices that teachers used um, in, that they had in common, for example, um, that even though they weren't written down, um, practices like multimodal strategies, which I'm going to go on to show you some examples of. So there was no policy. The group was included within the school's broad inclusion aims, but the senior leadership team were um, not in agreement on the need for a policy. Um, and actually, this quote on the screen suggests a preference for um, no policy over one that couldn't be properly implemented with the limited resources in school. So here you can see on the screen some contrasting views about the value of home first languages. And also mismatches in the number of um, home languages recorded. And this really emphasizes um, the um, tension and the um, conflicting understandings of what EAL means. Um, to, to teachers in school. So it's clear though that teachers um, consider EAL not to be a homogenous group um, with so many different understandings of what our EAL um, means. But despite all these really positive um, understandings of, of EEL learners, there's a tendency to manage with general resources, um, supporting EEL learners as a group. And again, the mainstreaming tendency, which contrasts to the DfE's um, distinctive approaches that they recommend. Which really leads us to this question um, of EL specific practice if the students do have distinctive needs. Okay, so visual resources were the most important strategy ranked by teachers in their interviews. And external resources, despite the school providing these, um, buying into this resource, were least important with teachers actually not using this resource. So no teachers were familiar with the national guidance or school policy, and um, none were able to provide details of other EAL documents, which reinforces a sense of ambiguity in this area in school. So interestingly, some teachers did consider that an EL specific policy could be of value, but that this would need to be accessible. And again, this contradicts the tendency to the tendency towards top down policies. OK. So in terms of um, the EL specific assessments, um, most teachers refer to these, but not by specific name. And only five of them said that they'd already used one of these types of assessments. And there was a lot of uncertainty on requirements for assessing and how often and what form that would take. Okay. Teachers had some other ideas for developing provision in school, including the need for an additional TA. 
and these ways depended on the age of learners as well and the stage that they were at in their English. So although there wasn't a formal multilingual pedagogy, the school had really clear aims to celebrate that diversity, for example, by offering um, books in their library of some of the home and first languages of pupils. And this playing a role in the curriculum and also in the registers. And multimodality, which refers to visuals, movement, sound, touch, smell and taste, was a really important shared practice that teachers used to support um, and engage EL learners as one group as part of the classroom and as well send students as well, students with special educational needs and disabilities. And at the bottom of the screen you have an example of that, of this story map used for all students, but something that teachers considered appealed to EL pupils and was accessible to them. And indeed, there's a lot of potential to do to carry out more research in this area. So the implications of this research then. So my study draws attention to school leaders and teachers' roles in shaping EL policy and provision. Um, and it had immediate um, benefits to the case school to support the head teacher's planned development of a policy. It adds the policy dimension um, and takes forward that model of teacher sense making in this way. And perhaps most importantly, um, at the moment, it raises the question again of. Um, the current national guidance and whether that could be developed by by policymakers um, to ensure that this guidance can support the educational achievement of marginalised pupils um, during the current situation, where needs are perhaps um, exasperated. Okay, so research in the future could focus on multimodal and multilingual pedagogies um, to consider whether this might um, support students' diverse needs. So translanguaging, for example. And tracing teachers' sense-making over a longer period of time, as obviously I was limited in this study to a period of six weeks. And such a longitudinal study would really prompt policymakers to think about um, how they could develop existing policies to provide clearer directions for these so-called distinctive approaches. Um, so thank you very much for listening to my Loom video and I hope that you find my paper interesting.